History of Greece by George Grote Volume 1 Legendary Greece Section 1 Legends Respecting the Gods The mythical world of the Greeks opens with the gods, anterior as well as superior to man, it gradually descends, first to heroes, and next to the human race. Along with the gods are found various monstrous natures, ultra-human and extra-human, who cannot with propriety be called gods, but who partake with gods and men in the attributes of free will, conscious agency, and susceptibility of pleasure and pain, such as the Harpies, the Gorgons, the Greia, the Sirens, Scylla and Charybdis, Echidna, Sphinx, Chimera, Chrysor, Pegasus, the Cyclopes, the Centaurs, etc. The first acts of what may be termed the great mythical cycle describe the proceedings of these gigantic agents, the crash and collision of certain terrific and overboiling forces, which are ultimately reduced to obedience, or chained up, or extinguished, under the more orderly government of Zeus, who supplants his less capable predecessors, and acquires precedence and supremacy over gods and men subject however to certain social restraints from the chief gods and goddesses around him, as well. As to the custom of occasionally convoking and consulting the divine Agora. I recount these events briefly, but literally, treating them simply as myths springing from the same creative imagination, addressing themselves to analogous tastes and feelings, and depending upon the same authority, as the legends of Thebes and Troy. It is the inspired voice of the muse which reveals and authenticates both, and from which Homer and Hesiod alike derive their knowledge the one, of the heroic, the other, of the divine, for time. I maintain, moreover, fully, the character of these great divine agents as persons, which is the light in which they presented themselves to the Homeric or Hesiodic audience. Uranos, Nyx, Hypnos, and Oniros, Heaven, Night, Sleep and Dream, are persons, just as much as Zeus and Apollo. To resolve them into mere allegories, is unsafe and unprofitable, we then depart from the point of view of the original hearers, without acquiring any consistent or philosophical point of view of our own. For although some of the attributes and actions ascribed to these persons are often explicable by allegory, the whole series and system of them never are so, the theorist who adopts this course of explanation finds that, after one or two simple and obvious steps, the path is no longer open and he is forced to clear a way for himself by gratuitous refinements and conjectures. The allegorical persons and attributes are always found mingled with other persons and attributes not allegorical, but the two classes cannot be severed without breaking up the whole march of the mythical events, nor can any explanation which drives us to such a necessity he considered as admissible. To suppose indeed that these legends could be all traced by means of allegory into a coherent body of physical doctrine, would be inconsistent with all reasonable presumptions respecting the age or society in which they arose. Where the allegorical mark is clearly set upon any particular character, or attribute, or event, to that extent we may recognize it, but we can rarely venture to divine further still less to alter the legends themselves on the faith of any such surmises. The theogony of the Greeks contains some cosmogonic ideas, but it cannot be considered as a system of cosmogony, or translated into a string of elementary, planetary, or physical changes. In the order of legendary chronology, Zeus comes after Cronus and Uranus, but in the order of Greek conception, Zeus is the prominent person, and Cronus and Uranus are inferior and introductory precursors, set up in order to be overthrown and to serve as mementos of the prowess of their conqueror. To Homer and Hesiod, as well as to the Greeks universally, Zeus is the great and predominant god, the father of gods and men, 
whose power none of the other gods can hope to resist, or even deliberately think of questioning. All the other gods have their specific potency and peculiar sphere of action and duty, with which Zeus does not usually interfere, but it is he who maintains the lineaments of a providential superintendence, as well over the phenomena of Olympus as over those of Earth. Zeus and his brothers Poseidon and Hades have made a division of power, he has reserved the ether and the atmosphere to himself Poseidon has obtained the sea and Hades the underworld or infernal regions, while earth, and the events which pass upon earth, are common to all of them, together with free access to Olympus. Zeus, then, with his brethren and colleagues, constitute the present gods, whom Homer and Hesiod recognize as in full dignity and efficiency. The inmates of this divine world are conceived upon the model, but not upon the scale, of the human. They are actuated by the full play and variety of those appetites, sympathies, passions and affections, which divide the soul of man, invested with a far larger and indeterminate measure of power, and an exemption as well from death as, with some rare exceptions, from suffering and infirmity. The rich and diverse types thus conceived, full of energetic movement and contrast, each in his own province, and soaring confessedly above the limits of experience, were of all themes the most suitable for adventure and narrative, and operated with irresistible force upon the Greek fancy. All nature was then conceived as moving and working through a number of personal agents, amongst whom the gods of Olympus were the most conspicuous, the reverential belief in Zeus and Apollo being only one branch of this omnipresent personifying faith. The attributes of all these agents had a tendency to expand themselves into illustrative legends especially those of the gods, who were constantly invoked in the public worship. Out of this same mental source sprang both the divine and heroic myths, the former being often the more extravagant and abn or mouse in their incidents, in proportion as the general type of the gods was more vast and awful than that of the heroes. As the gods have houses and wives like men, so the present dynasty of gods must have a past to repose upon, and the curious and imaginative Greek, whenever he does not find a recorded past ready to his hand, is uneasy until he has created one. Thus the Hesiodic Theogony explains, with a certain degree of system and coherence, first the antecedent circumstances under which Zeus acquired the divine empire, next the number of his colleagues and descendants. First in order of time, we are told by Hesiod, came chaos, next Gia the broad, firm, and flat earth, with deep and dark Tartarus at her base. Eros, love, the subduer of gods as well as men, came immediately afterwards. From chaos sprung Erebus and Nyx, from these latter Aether and Hemera. Gia also gave birth to Uranos, equal in breadth to herself, in order to serve both as an overarching vault to her and as a residence for the immortal gods, she further produced the mountains, habitations of the divine nymphs, and Pontus, the barren and billowy sea. Then Gia intermarried with Uranos, and from this union came a numerous offspring twelve titans and titanides, three cyclopes and three hecatonchires or beings with a hundred hands each. The titans were Oceanus, Coeos, Crius, Hyperion, Iapetos, and Cronus, the Tetanides, Thia, Rhea, Themis, Mnemosyne, Phoebe, and Tethys. The Cyclopes were Brontes, Steropes, and Argesh, formidable persons, equally distinguished for strength and for manual craft, so that they made the thunder which afterwards formed the irresistible artillery of Zeus. The Hecatonchires were Kados, Bryaeus, and Gyges, of prodigious bodily force. Uranos and Cronus Uranos contemplated this powerful brood with fear and horror, as fast as any of them were born, he concealed them in cavities of the earth, 
and would not permit them to come out. Chia could find no room for them, and groaned under the pressure, she produced iron, made a sickle, and implored her sons to avenge both her and themselves against the oppressive treatment of their father. But none of them, except Cronus, had courage to undertake the deed, he, the youngest and the most daring, was armed with the sickle and placed in suitable ambush by the contrivance of Gia. Presently night arrived, and Uranos descended to the embraces of Gia, Cronus then emerged from his concealment, cut off the genitals of his father, and cast the bleeding member behind him far away into the sea. Much of the blood was spilt upon the earth, and Gia in consequence gave birth to the irresistible Erinys, the vast and muscular Gigantes, and the Melian nymphs. Out of the genitals themselves, as they swam and foamed upon the sea, emerged the goddess Aphrodite, deriving her name from the foam out of which she had sprung. She first landed at Cythera, and then went to Cyprus, the island felt her benign influence, and the green herb started up under her soft and delicate tread. Eras immediately joined her, and partook with her the function of suggesting and directing the amorous impulses both of gods and men. Uranus being thus dethroned and disabled, Cronus and the Titans acquired their liberty and became predominant, the Cyclopes and the Hecatonchires had been cast by Uranus into Tartarus, and were still allowed to remain there. Each of the Titans had a numerous offspring, Oceanus, especially, marrying his sister Tethys, begot three thousand daughters, the Oceanic Nymphs, and as many sons, the rivers and springs passed for his offspring. Hyperion and his sister Thya had for their children Helios, Selene, and Eos, Coeos with Phoebe begot Leto and Asteria, the children of Crius were Astrios, Pallas, and Perses, from Astrios and Eos sprang the wines Zephyrus, Boreas, and Notus. Iapetos, marrying the oceanic nymph Clymene, counted as his progeny the celebrated Prometheus, Epimetheus, Menoetius, and Atlas. But the offspring of Cronus were the most powerful and transcendent of all. He married his sister Rhea, and had by her three daughters Hestia, Demeter, and Hera, and three sons, Hades, Poseidon, and Zeus, the latter at once the youngest and the greatest. But Cronus foreboded to himself destruction from one of his own children, and accordingly, as soon as any of them were born, he immediately swallowed them and retained them in his own belly. In this manner had the first five been treated, and Rhea was on the point of being delivered of Zeus. Grieved and indignant at the loss of her children, she applied for counsel to her father and mother, Uranos and Gia who aided her to conceal the birth of Zeus. They conveyed her by night to Lictus in Crete, hid the newborn child in a woody cavern on Mount Ida, and gave to Cronus, in place of it, a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes, which he greedily swallowed, believing it to be his child. Thus was the safety of Zeus ensured. As he grew up his vast powers fully developed themselves, at the suggestion of Gia. He induced Cronus by stratagem to vomit up, first the stone which had been given to him, next, the five children whom he had previously devoured. Hestia, Demeter, Hyr, Poseidon and Hades, were thus allowed to grow up along with Zeus, and the stone to which the latter owed his preservation was placed near the temple of Delphi, where it ever afterwards stood as a conspicuous and venerable memorial to the religious Greek. The Titans We have not yet exhausted the catalogue of beings generated during this early period, anterior to the birth of Zeus. Nyx, alone and without any partner, gave birth to a numerous progeny, Thanatos, Hypnos, and Oniros, Momus and Oise, Grief, Clotho, Lachesis, and Atropus the three fates, the retributive and equalizing nemesis, apate and philotes, deceit and amorous propensity, germ, 
old age, an heiress, contention. From heiress proceeded an abundant offspring, all mischievous and maleficent, ponos, suffering, lethe, limos, famine, phonos, and maca, slaughter and battle, dysnomia, and ate, lawlessness and reckless impulse, and horcos, the ever-watchful sanctioner of oaths, as well as the inexorable punisher of voluntary perjury. Gia, too, intermarrying with Pontus, gave birth to Nereus, the just and righteous old man of the sea, to Thaumas, Forcais and Quito. From Nereus and Doris, daughter of Oceanus, proceeded the fifty Nereids or sea nymphs. Thaumas also married Electra daughter of Oceanus, and had by her Iris and the two harpies, Aloe and Ochipet winged and swift as the wines. From Forcais and Quito sprung the dragon of the Hesperides, and the monstrous Greia and Gorgons, the blood of Medusa, one of the Gorgons, when killed by Perseus, produced Chrysler Saeer and the horse Pegasus, Chrysler Saeer and Caliroe gave birth to Gerion as well as to Echidna a creature half-nymph and hall serpent, unlike both to gods and to men. Other monsters arose from the union of Echidna with Typhaeon, Orthros, the two-headed dog of Gerion, Cerberus, the dog of Hades, with fifty heads, and the Lernian Hydra. From the latter proceeded the Chimera, the Sphinx of Thebes, and the Nemean Lion. A powerful and important progeny, also, was that of Styx, daughter of Oceanus, by Pallas. She had zealous and Nike, imperiousness and victory, and Kratos and Bia, strength and force. The hearty and early cooperation of Styx and her four sons with Zeus was one of the main causes which enabled him to achieve his victory over the Titans. Zeus had grown up not less distinguished for mental capacity than for bodily force. He and his brothers now determined to wrest the power from the hands of Cronus and the Titans, and a long and desperate struggle commenced, in which all the gods and all the goddesses took part. Zeus convoked them to Olympus, and promised to all who would aid him against Cronus, that their functions and privileges should remain undisturbed. The first who responded to the call, came with her four sons, and embraced his cause was Styx. Zeus took them all four as his constant attendants, and conferred upon Styx the majestic distinction of being the Horcos, or oath sanctioner of the gods. What Horcos was to men, Styx was to the gods. Still further to strengthen himself, Zeus released the other Uranids who had been imprisoned in Tartarus by their father, the Cyclopes and the Centimons, and prevailed upon them to take part with him against the Titans. The former supplied him with thunder and lightning, and the latter brought into the fight their boundless muscular strength. Ten full years did the combat continue, Zeus and the Cronids occupying Olympus, and the Titans being established on the more southerly mountain chain of Othrys. All nature was convulsed, and the distant Oceanus, though he took no part in the struggle, felt the boiling, the noise, and the shock, not less than Gia and Pontus. The thunder of Zeus, combined with the crags and mountains torn up and burled by the Centimons, at length prevailed, and the Titans were defeated and thrown down into Tartarus. Iapetos, Cronus, and the remaining Titans, Oceanus excepted, were imprisoned, perpetually and irrevocably, in that subterranean dungeon, a wall of brass being built around them by Poseidon, and the three Centimons being planted as guards. Of the two sons of Iapetos, Menoetius was made to share this prison, while Atlas was condemned to stand forever at the extreme west and to bear upon his shoulders the solid vault of heaven. Thus were the Titans subdued, and the Cronids with Zeus at their head placed in possession of power. They were not, however, yet quite secure, for Gia, intermarrying with Tartarus, gave birth to a new and still more formidable monster called Typhoeus, 
of such tremendous properties and promise, that, had he been allowed to grow into full development, nothing could have prevented him from vanquishing all rivals and becoming supreme. But Zeus foresaw the danger, smote him at once with a thunderbolt from Olympus, and burned him up, he was cast along with the rest into Tartarus, and no further enemy remained to question the sovereignty of the Cronids. Poseidon, Hades With Zeus begins a new dynasty and a different order of beings. Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades agree upon the distribution before noticed, of functions and localities, Zeus retaining the ether and the atmosphere, together with the general presiding function, Poseidon obtaining the sea, and administering subterranean forces generally, and Hades ruling the underworld or region in which the half-animated shadows of departed men reside. It has been already stated, that in Zeus, his brothers, and his sisters, and his and their divine progeny, we find the present gods, that is, those, for the most part, whom the Homeric and Hesiodic Greeks recognized and worshipped. The wives of Zeus were numerous as well as his offspring. First be married Metis, the wisest and most sagacious of the goddesses, but Gia and Uranos forewarned him that if he permitted himself to have children by her, they would be stronger than himself and dethrone him. Accordingly when Metis was on the point of being delivered of Athena, he swallowed her up, and her wisdom and sagacity thus became permanently identified with his own being. His head was subsequently cut open, in order to make way for the exit and birth of the goddess Athena. By Themis, Zeus begot the Ori, by Urinome, the three charities or graces, by Mnemosyne, the Muses, by Leto, Latona, Apollo, and Artemis, and by Demeter, Persephone. Last of all he took for his wife Hera, who maintained permanently the dignity of queen of the gods, by her he had Hebe, Ares, and Iliathea. Hermes also was born to him by Maya the daughter of Atlas, Hephaestus was born to Hera, according to some accounts, by Zeus, according to others, by her own unaided generative force. He was born lame, and Hera was ashamed of him, she wished to secrete him away, but he made his escape into the sea, and found shelter under the maternal care of the Nereids Thetis and Urinome. Our enumeration of the divine race, under the presidency of Zeus, will thus give us 1. The twelve great gods and goddesses of Olympus Zeus, Poseidon, Apollo, Ares, Hephaestus, Hermes, Hera, Athena, Artemis, Aphrodite, Hestia, Demeter. 2. An indefinite number of other deities, not included among the Olympic, seemingly because the number twelve was complete without them but some of them not inferior in power and dignity to many of the twelve, Hades, Helios, Hecate, Dionysus, Leto, Diane, Persephone, Selene, Themis, Eos, Harmonia, the Charities, the Muses, the Elathium, the Mori, the Oceanids, and the Nereids, Proteus, Idothea, the Nymphs, Leucothea, Phorchis, Aeolus, Nemesis, etc. 3. Deities who perform special services to the greater gods, Iris, Hebe, the Ori, etc. 4. Deities whose personality is more faintly and unsteadily conceived, 8. The Lydi, Eris, Thanatos, Hypnos, Kratos, Bia, Asa, etc. The same name is here employed sometimes to designate the person, Sometimes the attribute or event not personified an unconscious transition of ideas, which, when consciously performed, is called allegory. 5. Monsters, offspring of the gods, the harpies, the gorgons, the Greia, Pegasus, Chrysler Saeer, Echidna, Chimera, the dragon of the Hesperides, Cerberus, Orthros, Gerion, the Lernian Hydra, 
the Nemean lion, Scylla, and Charybdis, the centaurs, the sphinx, Xanthos and Balios the immortal horses, etc. Hesiodic Theogony From the gods we slide down insensibly, first to heroes, and then to men, but before we proceed to this new mixture, it is necessary to say a few words on the Theogony generally. I have given it briefly as it stands in the Hesiodic Theogonia, because that poem in spite of great incoherence and confusion, arising seemingly from diversity of authorship as well as diversity of age presents an ancient and genuine attempt to cast the divine foretime into a systematic sequence. Homer and Hesiod were the grand authorities in the pagan world respecting Theogony, but in the Iliad and Odyssey nothing is found except passing allusions and implications, and even in the hymns, which were commonly believed in antiquity to be the productions of the same author as the Iliad and the Odyssey, there are only isolated, unconnected narratives. Accordingly men habitually took their information respecting their theogonic antiquities from the Hesiodic poem, where it was ready laid out before them, and the legends consecrated in that work acquired both an extent of circulation and a firm hold on the national faith, such as independent legends could seldom or never rival. Moreover the scrupulous and skeptical pagans, as well as the open assailants of paganism in later times, derived their subjects of attack from the same source, so that it has been absolutely necessary to recount in their naked simplicity the Hesiodic stories, in order to know what it was that Plato deprecated and Xenophanes denounced. The strange proceedings ascribed to Uranus, Cronus, and Zeus, have been more frequently alluded to, in the way of ridicule or condemnation, than any other portion of the mythical world. But though the Hesiodic Theogony passed as orthodox among the later pagans, because it stood before them as the only system anciently set forth and easily accessible, it was evidently not the only system received at the date of the poem itself. Homer knows nothing of Uranus, in the sense of an arch-god anterior to Cronus. Uranus and Gia, like Oceanus, Tethys, and Nyx, are with him great and venerable gods, but neither the one nor the other present the character of predecessors of Cronus and Zeus. The Cyclopes, whom Hesiod ranks as sons of Uranus and fabricators of thunder, are in Homer neither one nor the other, they are not noticed in the Iliad at all, and in the Odyssey they are gross gigantic shepherds and cannibals having nothing in common with the Hesiodic Cyclops except the one round central eye. Of the three centimons enumerated by Hesiod, Briaeus only is mentioned in Homer, and to all appearance, not as the son of Uranus, but as the son of Poseidon, not as aiding Zeus in his combat against the Titans, but as rescuing him at a critical moment from a conspiracy formed against him by Hera, Poseidon, and Athena. Not only is the Hesiodic Uranus, with the Uranids, omitted in Homer, but the relations between Zeus and Cronus are also presented in a very different light. No mention is made of Cronus swallowing his young children, on the contrary, Zeus is the eldest of the three brothers instead of the youngest, and the children of Cronus live with him and Rhea. There the stolen intercourse between Zeus and Hera first takes place without the knowledge of their parents. When Zeus puts Cronus down into Tartarus, Rhea consigns her daughter Hera to the care of Oceanus, no notice do we find of any terrific battle with the Titans as accompanying that event. Cronus, Iapetos, and the remaining Titans are down in Tartarus, in the lowest depths under the earth far removed from the genial rays of Helios, but they are still powerful and venerable, and Hypnos makes Hera swear an oath in their name, as the most inviolable that he can think of. Homeric Theogony In Homer, then, we find nothing beyond the simple fact that Zeus threw his father Cronus together with the remaining Titans into Tartarus, an event to which he affords us a tolerable parallel in certain occurrences even under the presidency of Zeus himself. 
For the other gods make more than one rebellious attempt against Zeus, and are only put down, partly by his unparalleled strength, partly by the presence of his ally the Sentimane Briaeus. Cronus, like Laertes, or Peleus, has become old, and has been supplanted by a force vastly superior to his own. The Homeric epic treats Zeus as present, and, like all the interesting heroic characters, a father must be assigned to him, that father has once been the chief of the Titans, but has been superseded and put down into Tartarus along with the latter, so soon as Zeus and the superior breed of the Olympic gods acquired their full development. That antithesis between Zeus and Cronus between the Olympic gods and the Titans which Homer has thus briefly brought to view, Hesiod has amplified into a theogony, with many things new, and some things contradictory to his predecessor, while Eumelus or Arctinus in the poem called Titanomachia, now lost, also adopted it as their special subject. As Stasian use, Arctinus, Lesches, and others, enlarged the legend of Troy by composing poems relating to a supposed time anterior to the commencement, or subsequent to the termination of the Iliad, as other poets recounted adventures of Odysseus subsequent to his landing in Ithaca, so Hesiod enlarged and systematized, at the same time that he corrupted, the skeleton theogony which we find briefly indicated in Homer. There is violence and rudeness in the Homeric gods, but the great genius of Greek epic is no way accountable for the stories of Uranos and Cronus, the standing reproach against pagan legendary narrative. How far these stories are the invention of Hesiod himself is impossible to determine. They bring us down to a cast of fancy more coarse and indelicate than the Homeric, and more nearly resembling some of the holy chapters of the more recent mysteries, such, for example, as the tale of Dionysus Zagreus. There is evidence in the Theogony itself that the author was acquainted with local legends current both at Crete and at Delphi, for he mentions both the mountain cave in Crete wherein the newborn Zeus was hidden, and the stone near the Delphian temple, the identical stone which Cronus had swallowed, placed by Zeus himself as a sign and wonder to mortal men. Both these two monuments, which the poet expressly refers to, and had probably seen, imply a whole train of accessory and explanatory local legends current probably among the priests of Crete and Delphi, between which places, in ancient times, there was an intimate religious connection. And we may trace further in the poem, that which would be the natural feeling of Cretan worshippers of Zeus, an effort to make out that Zeus was justified in his aggression on Cronus, by the conduct of Cronus himself both towards his father and towards his children, the treatment of Cronus by Zeus appears in Hesiod as the retribution foretold and threatened by the mutilated Uranos against the son who had outraged him. In fact the relations of Uranos and Gia are in almost all their particulars a mere copy and duplication of those between Cronus and Rhea, differing only in the mode whereby the final catastrophe is brought about. Now castration was a practice thoroughly abhorrent both to the feelings and to the customs of Greece, but it was seen with melancholy frequency in the domestic life as well as in the religious worship of Phrygia and other parts of Asia, and it even became the special qualification of a priest of the great mother Sibylle, as well as of the Ephesian Artemis. The employment of the sickle ascribed to Cronus seems to be the product of an imagination familiar with the Asiatic worship and legends, which were connected with and partially resembled the Cretan. And this deduction becomes the more probable when we connect it with the first genesis of iron, which Hesiod mentions to have been produced for the express purpose of fabricating the fatal sickle, for metallurgy finds a place in the early legends both of the Trojan and of the Cretan Ida, and the three Idaean dactyls, the legendary inventors of it, are assigned sometimes to one and sometimes to the other. 
As Hesiod had extended the Homeric series of gods by prefixing the dynasty of Uranos to that of Cronus, so the Orphic Theogony lengthened it still further. First came Cronos, or Time, as a person, after him Aether and Chaos, out of whom Cronos produced the vast mundane egg. Hence emerged in process of time the first-born god Phones, or Métis, or Hericopios, a person of double sex, who first generated the cosmos, or mundane system, and who carried within him the seed of the gods. He gave birth to Nyx, by whom he begot Uranos and Gia, as well as to Helios and Selene. From Uranos and Gia sprang the three Mori, or Fates, the three Centimons and the three Cyclopes, these latter were cast by Uranos into Tartarus, under the foreboding that they would rob him of his dominion. In revenge for this maltreatment of her sons, Gia produced of herself the fourteen titans, seven male and seven female, the former were Chaos, Cryos, Forkais, Cronus, Oceanus, Hyperion, and Iapetos, the latter were Themis, Tethys, Mnemosyne, Thera, Dione, Phoebe, and Rhea. They received the name of Titans because they avenged upon Uranos the expulsion of their elder brothers. Six of the Titans, headed by Cronus the most powerful of them all, conspiring against Uranos, castrated and dethroned him, Oceanus alone stood aloof and took no part in the aggression. Cronus assumed the government and fixed his seat on Olympos, while Oceanus remained apart, master of his own divine stream. The reign of Cronus was a period of tranquility and happiness, as well as of extraordinary longevity and vigor. Orphic Theogony Cronus and Rhea gave birth to Zeus and his brothers and sisters. The concealment and escape of the infant Zeus, and the swallowing of the stone by Cronus, are given in the Orphic Theogony substantially in the same manner as by Hesiod, only in a style less simple and more mystified. Zeus is concealed in the cave of Nyx, the seat of Phans himself, along with Ride and Adristea, who nurse and preserve him, while the armed dance and sonorous instruments of the Kurides prevent his infant cries from reaching the ears of Cronus. When grown up, he lays a snare for his father, intoxicates him with honey, and having surprised him in the depth of sleep, enchains and castrates him. Thus exalted to the supreme mastery, he swallowed and absorbed into himself Métis, or fans, with all the pre-existing elements of things, and then generated all things anew out of his own being and conformably to his own divine ideas. So scanty are the remains of this system, that we find it difficult to trace individually the gods and goddesses sprung from Zeus beyond Apollo, Dionysus, and Persephone, the latter being confounded with Artemis and Hecate. But there is one new personage, begotten by Zeus, who stands preeminently marked in the Orphic Theogony, and whose adventures constitute one of its peculiar features. Zacrus, the horned child, is the son of Zeus by his own daughter Persephone, he is the favorite of his father, a child of magnificent promise, and predestined, if he grow up, to succeed to supreme dominion as well as to the handling of the thunderbolt. He is seated, whilst an infant, on the throne beside Zeus, guarded by Apollo and the Kurides. But the jealous Hera intercepts his career and incites the Titans against him, who, having first smeared their faces with plaster, approach him on the throne, tempt his childish fancy with playthings, and kill him with a sword while he is contemplating his face in a mirror. They then cut up his body and boil it in a cauldron, leaving only the heart, which is picked up by Athena and carried to Zeus who in his wrath strikes down the titans with thunder into Tartarus, whilst Apollo is directed to collect the remains of Zacrus and bury them at the foot of Mount Parnassus. The heart is given to Semele, and Zacrus is born again from her under the form of Dionysus. 
such as the tissue of violent fancies comprehended under the title of the Orphic Theogony, and read as such, it appears, by Plato, Isocrates and Aristotle. It will be seen that it is based upon the Hesiodic Theogony, but according to the general expansive tendency of Greek legend, much new matter is added, Zeus has in Homer one predecessor, in Hesiod two, and in Orpheus four. The Hesiodic Theogony, though later in date than the Iliad and Odyssey, was coeval with the earliest period of what may be called Greek history, and certainly of an age earlier than 700 BC. It appears to have been widely circulated in Greece, and being at once ancient and short, the general public consulted it as their principal source of information respecting divine antiquity. The Orphic Theogony belongs to a later date, and contains the Hesiodic ideas and persons, enlarged and mystically disguised, its vein of invention was less popular, adapted more to the contemplation of a sect specially prepared than to the taste of a casual audience, and it appears accordingly to have obtained currency chiefly among purely speculative men. Among the majority or these latter, however, it acquired greater veneration, and above all was supposed to be of greater antiquity, than the Hesiodic. The belief in its superior antiquity, disallowed by Herodotus, and seemingly also by Aristotle, as well as the respect for its contents, increased during the Alexandrian age and through the declining centuries of paganism, reaching its maximum among the new Platonists of the 3rd and 4th century after Christ both the Christian assailants, as well as the defenders, of paganism, treated it as the most ancient and venerable summary of the Grecian faith. Orpheus is celebrated by Pindar as the harper and companion of the Argonautic maritime heroes, Orpheus and Musius, as well as Painfoss and Olin, the great supposed authors of theogonic, mystical, oracular, and prophetic verses and hymns were generally considered by literary Greeks as older than either Hesiod or Homer, and such was also the common opinion of modern scholars until a period comparatively recent. It has now been shown, on sufficient ground, that the compositions which passed under these names emanate for the most part from poets of the Alexandrian age, and subsequent to the Christian era, and that even the earliest among them, which served as the stock on which the later editions were engrafted, belonged to a period far more recent than Hesiod. It seems, however, certain, that both Orpheus and Musius were names of established reputation at the time when Onomacritus flourished, and it is distinctly stated by Pausanias that the latter was himself the author of the most remarkable and characteristic myth of the Orphic Theogony, the disruption of Zacrus by the Titans, and his resurrection as Dionysus. Foreign Religious Influence The names of Orpheus and Musius, as well as that of Pythagoras, looking at one side of his character, represent facts of importance in the history of the Greek mind the gradual influx of Thracian, Phrygian, and Egyptian, religious ceremonies and feelings, and the increasing diffusion of special mysteries schemes for religious purification, and orgies, I venture to anglicize the Greek word, which contains in its original meaning no implication of the ideas of excess to which it was afterwards diverted in honor of some particular god distinct both from the public solemnities and from the gentile solemnities of primitive Greece, celebrated apart from the citizens generally, and approachable only through a certain course of preparation and initiation, sometimes even forbidden to be talked of in the presence of the uninitiated, under the severest threats of divine judgment. Occasionally, such voluntary combinations assumed the form of permanent brotherhoods, bound together by periodical solemnities as well as by vows of an ascetic character, thus the Orphic life, as it was called, or regulation of the Orphic brotherhood, among other injunctions partly arbitrary and partly abstinent, forbade animal food universally, and on certain occasions, the use of woolen clothing. 
the great religious and political fraternity of the Pythagoreans, which acted so powerfully on the condition of the Italian cities, was one of the many manifestations of this general tendency, which stands in striking contrast with the simple, open-hearted and demonstrative worship of the Homeric Greeks. Festivals at seed time and harvest at the vintage and at the opening of the new wine were doubtless coeval with the earliest habits of the Greeks, the latter being a period of unusual joviality. Yet in the Homeric poems, Dionysus and Demeter, the patrons of the vineyard and the cornfield, are seldom mentioned, and decidedly occupy little place in the imagination of the poet as compared with the other gods nor are they of any conspicuous importance even in the Hesiodic Theogony. But during the interval between Hesiod and Onomacritus, the revolution in the religious mind of Greece was such as to place both these deities in the front rank. According to the Orphic doctrine, Zagreus, son of Persephone, is destined to be the successor of Zeus, and although the violence of the Titans intercepts this lot, Yet even when he rises again from his desertion under the name of Dionysus, he is the colleague and co-equal of his divine father. This remarkable change, occurring as it did during the 6th and a part of the 7th century before the Christian era, may be traced to the influence of communication with Egypt, which only became fully open to the Greeks about BC 660, as well as with Thrace, Phrygia and Lydia. From hence new religious ideas and feelings were introduced, which chiefly attached themselves to the characters of Dionysius and Demeter. The Greeks identified these two deities with the great Egyptian Osiris and Isis, so that what was borrowed from the Egyptian worship of the two latter naturally fell to their equivalents in the Grecian system. Moreover the worship of Dionysus, under what name cannot be certainly made out, was indigenous in Thrace, as that of the Great Mother was in Phrygia, and in Lydia together with those violent ecstasies and manifestations of temporary frenzy, and that clashing of noisy instruments, which we find afterwards characterizing it in Greece. The great masters of the pipe as well as the dithyram, and indeed the whole musical system appropriated to the worship of Dionysus which contrasted so pointedly with the quiet solemnity of the paean addressed to Apollo were all originally Phrygian. Post-Homeric Changes in Religion From all these various countries, novelties, unknown to the Homeric men, found their way into the Greek worship, and there is one amongst them which deserves to be specially noticed, because it marks the generation of the new class of ideas in their theology. Homer mentions many persons guilty of private or involuntary homicide, and compelled either to go into exile or to make pecuniary satisfaction, but he never once describes any of them to have either received or required purification for the crime. Now in the time subsequent to Homer, purification for homicide comes to be considered as indispensable, the guilty person is regarded as unfit for the society of man or the worship of the gods until he has received it, and special ceremonies are prescribed whereby it is to be administered. Herodotus tells us that the ceremony of purification was the same among the Lydians and among the Greeks, we know that it formed no part of the early religion of the latter, and we may perhaps reasonably suspect that they borrowed it from the former. The oldest instance known to us of expiation for homicide was contained in the epic poem of the Milesian Arctinus, wherein Achilles is purified by Odysseus for the murder of their sites. Several others occurred in the later or Hesiodic epic Heracles, Peleus, Bellerophon, Alcmion, Amphictyum, Pomander, Triopas, from whence they probably passed through the hands of the logographers to Apollodorus, Diodorus, and others. The purification of the murderer was originally operated, not by the hands of any priest or specially sanctified man, but by those of a chief or king, 
who goes through the appropriate ceremonies in the manner recounted by Herodotus in his pathetic narrative respecting Croesus and Adrastus. The idea of a special taint of crime, and of the necessity as well as the sufficiency of prescribed religious ceremonies as a means of removing it, appears thus to have got footing in Greek practice subsequent to the time of Homer. The peculiar rites or orgies, composed or put together by Onomacritus, Methapus, and other men of more than the ordinary piety, were founded upon a similar mode of thinking, and adapted to the same mental exigencies. They were voluntary religious manifestations, superinduced upon the old public sacrifices of the king or chiefs on behalf of the whole society, and of the father on his own family hearth they marked out the details of divine service proper to appease or gratify the God to whom they were addressed, and to procure for the believers who went through them his blessings and protection here or hereafter the exact performance of the divine service in all its specialty was held necessary, and thus the priests or hierophants, who alone were familiar with the ritual, acquired a commanding position. Generally speaking, these peculiar orgies obtained their admission and their influence at periods of distress, disease, public calamity and danger, or religious terror and despondency, which appear to have been but too frequent in their occurrence. The minds of men were prone to the belief that what they were suffering arose from the displeasure of some of the gods, and as they found that the ordinary sacrifices and worship were insufficient for their protection, so they grasped at new suggestions proposed to them with the view of regaining the divine favor. Such suggestions were more usually copied, either in whole or in part, from the religious rites of some foreign locality, or from some other portion of the Hellenic world, and in this manner many new sects or voluntary religious fraternities, promising to relieve the troubled conscience and to reconcile the sick or suffering with the offended gods, acquired permanent establishment as well as considerable influence. They were generally under the superintendence of hereditary families of priests, who imparted the rites of confirmation and purification to communicants generally, no one who went through the prescribed ceremonies being excluded. In many cases, such ceremonies fell into the hands of jugglers, who volunteered their services to wealthy men, and degraded their profession as well by obtrusive venality as by extravagant promises, Sometimes the price was lowered to bring them within reach of the poor and even of slaves. But the wide diffusion, and the number of voluntary communicants of these solemnities, proves how much they fell in with the feeling of the time and how much respect they enjoyed a respect, which the more conspicuous establishments, such as Eleusis and Samothrace, maintained for several centuries and the visit of the Cretan Epimenides to Athens in the time of Solon, and at a season of the most serious disquietude and dread of having offended the gods illustrates the tranquilizing effect of new orgies and rites of absolution, when enjoined by a man standing high in the favor of the gods and reputed to be the son of a nymph. The supposed Erythrian Sibyl, and the earliest collection of Sibylline prophecies, afterwards so much multiplied and interpolated, and referred, according to Greek custom, to an age even earlier than Homer, appear to belong to a date not long posterior to Epimenides. Other oracular verses, such as those of Bacchus, were treasured up in Athens and other cities, the sixth century before the Christian era was fertile in these kinds of religious manifestations. Amongst the special rites and orgies of the character just described, those which enjoyed the greatest Panhellenic reputation were attached to the Idean Zeus in Crete, to Demeter at Eleusis, to the Kaberi in Samothrace, and to Dionysus at Delphi and Thebes. That they were all to a great degree analogous, is shown by the way in which they unconsciously run together and become confused in the minds of various authors the ancient inquirers themselves were unable to distinguish one from the other, 
and we must be content to submit to the like ignorance. But we see enough to satisfy us of the general fact, that during the century and a half which elapsed between the opening of Egypt to the Greeks and the commencement of their struggle with the Persian kings, the old religion was largely adulterated by importations from Egypt, Asia Minor, and Thrace. The rites grew to be more furious and ecstatic, exhibiting the utmost excitement, bodily as well as mental, the legends became at once more coarse, more tragical, and less pathetic. The manifestations of this frenzy were strongest among the women, whose religious susceptibilities were often found extremely unmanageable, and who had everywhere congregative occasional ceremonies of their own, apart from the men indeed, in the ease of the colonists, especially of the Asiatic colonists, the women had been originally women of the country, and as such retained to a great degree their non-Hellenic manners and feelings. The god Dionysus, whom the legends described as clothed in feminine attire, and leading a troop of frenzied women, inspired a temporary ecstasy, and those who resisted the inspiration, being supposed to disobey his will, were punished either by particular judgments or by mental terrors, while those who gave full loose to the feeling, is the appropriate season and with the received solemnities, satisfied his exigencies, and believed themselves to have procured immunity from such disquietudes for the future. Crowds of women, clothed with fawn skins and bearing the sanctified thyrsus, flocked to the solitudes of Parnassus or Kitharon or Caegidus, during the consecrated triennial period, passed the night there with torches, and abandoned themselves to demonstrations of frantic excitement, with dancing and clamorous invocation of the god, they were said to tear animals limb from limb, to devour the raw flesh, and to cut themselves without feeling the wound. The men yielded to a similar impulse by noisy revels in the streets, sounding the cymbals and tambourine, and carrying the image of the god in procession. It deserves to be remarked, that the Athenian women never practiced these periodical mountain excursions, so common among the rest of the Greeks, they had their feminine solemnities of the Thesmophoria, mournful in their character and accompanied with fasting, and their separate congregations at the temples of Aphrodite, but without any extreme or unseemly demonstrations. The state festival of the Dionysia, in the city of Athens, was celebrated with dramatic entertainments, and the once rich harvest of Athenian tragedy and comedy was thrown up under its auspices. The ceremonies of the Kurides in Crete, originally armed dances in honor of the Idean Zeus, seem also to have borrowed from Asia so much of fury, of self-infliction, and of mysticism, that they became at last inextricably confounded with the Phrygian Corybants or worshippers of the Great Mother, though it appears that Greek reserve always stopped short of the irreparable self-mutilation of Aedes. The influence of the Thracian religion upon that of the Greeks cannot be traced in detail, but the ceremonies contained in it were of a violent and fierce character, like the Phrygian, and acted upon Hellas in the same general direction as the latter. And the like may be said of the Egyptian religion, which was in this case the more operative, inasmuch as all the intellectual Greeks were naturally attracted to go and visit the wonders on the banks of the Nile, the powerful effect produced upon them is attested by many evidences, but especially by the interesting narrative of Herodotus. Now the Egyptian ceremonies were at once more licentious, and more profuse in the outpouring both of joy and sorrow, than the Greek, but a still greater difference sprang from the extraordinary power, separate mode of life, minute observances and elaborate organization of the priesthood. The ceremonies of Egypt were multitudinous, but the legends concerning them were framed by the priests, and as a general rule, seemingly, known to the priests alone, at least they were not intended to be publicly talked of, even by pious men. They were holy stories, which it was sacrilege publicly to mention, 
and which from this very prohibition only took firmer hold of the minds of the Greek visitors who heard them. And thus the element of secrecy and mystic silence foreign to Homer, and only faintly glanced at in Hesiod if it was not originally derived from Egypt, at least received from thence its greatest stimulus and diffusion. The character of the legends themselves was naturally affected by this change from publicity to secrecy, the secrets when revealed would be such as to justify by their own tenor the interdict on public divulgation, instead of being adapted, like the Homeric myth, to the universal sympathies and hearty interest of a crowd of hearers, they would derive their impressiveness from the tragical, mournful, extravagant, or terror-striking character of the incidents. Such a tendency, which appears explicable and probable even on general grounds, was in this particular case rendered still more certain by the coarse taste of the Egyptian priests. That any recondite doctrine, religious or philosophical, was attached to the mysteries or contained in the holy stories, has never been shown, and is to the last degree improbable though the affirmative has been asserted by many learned men.